We're back, NEC Hoops fans, for the second edition of the new year of the NEC On The Run Hoops podcast. I'm joined this week by St. Francis, Brooklyn alum, Glenn Sanabria. Glenn, thanks so much for stopping yeah, by the studio. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. It's going to be a great show. Glenn's going to give us all his insight from his four years as a Terrier. And we're going to get started right away before we hit what was a big week of NEC basketball action. I want to talk to Glenn a little bit about his time in, uh, on Remsen Street, in Brooklyn Heights, and your career. So I know you're a Staten Island guy. Yep. You made the short hop here to the, to the front row compound. What enticed you to cross the Verrazano and continue your athletic and academic career at St. Francis? You know, a lot of things came into that decision for me, uh, you know, and it's crazy how five years later this is all just, you know, transpired and now I get to look back and be in positions, I guess, to talk about it. Uh, you know, but a lot of things went into my decision, uh, first and foremost, that they were the only Division One school to give me a scholarship and uh, Coach Breaker and his staff were uh, generous enough to do that for me and they believed in me enough uh, to do it. And then, uh, you know, my family is from there. Uh, I'm close. I'm only 30 minutes over the bridge, so the fact that they can come to my games and, uh, and the opportunity, the challenge of me going in there and, and potentially, uh, you know, creating something special for myself was something that, you know, enticed me and excited me to go there. Over your four years, I used to call you Mr. Big Shot. You hit <laughs> so many big shots over the years, clutch. You wanted the ball in your hands at the end of the game. What were some of your highlights during your time as a Terrier? Um, you know, my favorite highlights were honestly not even those shots. It was honestly my first year on just how good we were as a team and as a unit. Um, just knowing that every game we were going to go in, I truly felt that we were going to win every single game. Uh, going in my freshman year with Brent Jones and, and, and Chris Hooper and Jalen Canada, just all those veteran guys and those tough guys. Uh, those are my favorite years uh, from, from school and my favorite times. But if we had to talk about shots, yeah, uh, one that sticks out of my mind that I always remember that was is special to me is that one at Robert Morris when we were playing at Duquesne. And, uh, you know, I think um, they scored a, a dunk or something and then everybody in the huddle was just defeated. But I, I just felt like we could still win this game, even though there was one second left when we were down by six. And then I happened to come down and, uh, and hit a three and then they turned the ball over at half court. Then we get the ball back, and I hit another three at the buzzer to go into overtime. You know, we, we lost the game, but it was just something about that, about that game that was special. And then <clears throat> I always just wanted the ball in my hands at the end of the game. It was always uh, something I, I felt confident at the end of the game, and I always wanted to, uh, to hit that shot because I put so much time in, in, into this. And just, uh, you know, even from when I was younger, uh, just always in the backyard just dreaming of three, two, one, and all that type of stuff. So uh, when it, when it kind of came into fruition for me as a player and, and then uh, me having the confidence in myself and then coach having the confidence in me to do it as well, uh, I just, I know I just went out there and it felt natural for me. What role did St. Francis have and maybe your head coach in shaping you not only as a player but as a person? Um, yeah, Coach Breaker has a huge influence on me as a person, as a player, and, uh, you know, and not even just as a coach, but as a friend at this point now, because we still uh, keep in contact often. Um, but just the fact that, you know, he took a chance on me uh, and believed in me that I had something to help his program. And I always felt it in myself, but for somebody else to, to, uh, to think that I, they have, that I have the potential to go out, uh, go out there and play, uh, was something that was special for me. And, uh, you know, I, I don't take that for granted. And, you know, he has, he has a great influence on me as a player, how to conduct myself as a person, um, you know, and him along with my parents are definitely, uh, you know, great mentors for me, even to this day. So now uh, your playing career is over at St. Francis. What does the future hold in store for Glenn Sanabria? Um, you know, I'm doing a lot of different things right now. You know, I'm doing uh, shows like this. I did a color commentary at, at uh, St. Francis and um, at the women's game. Uh, you know, I'm still trying to keep my basketball dream alive. I'm still uh, practicing and staying sharp, uh, trying to stay in shape. Uh, it's looking like towards the end of this month I might be able to. Uh, it's a good chance I'll be able to go to Puerto Rico and play because there was a team that drafted me there last year. Just couldn't go because how school worked out. Uh, but. You know, I'm looking forward to, to trying to get that opportunity to go do that. Um, so I'm trying to get my hands in every little thing that I can. Uh, I'm actually doing some even some stuff in music, uh, just doing a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, just trying to, you know, 
uh, give myself the opportunity to do as many things as possible and, and trying to be great in everything. And what was your major? Uh, business management. Yeah. And, and oh, I also didn't touch on, I'm also working on my master's now in organizational management, which I started in my uh, final year last year, my graduate year. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I have two more classes left on that, so I should be finished in May and, you know, it's a, it's a, it should be a good year. Well, that's great, Glenn. I wish you all the luck moving forward. I hope to bring you back in here a few more times <laughs> before you go and continue your professional playing career, possibly, or whatever the future holds for you. But now let's get into the last week of NEC Hoops. Let's start this week, as always, with our weekend takeaways. Glenn, <clears throat> my takeaway from this weekend, we had four teams. LIU, Merrimack, Robert Morris, St. Francis U, all went 2-0. Those sweeps, we started to get some separation in the standings after a tight first week of play. But let's start with Robert Morris. Robert Morris, the last undefeated team. The dream is down to one. They are 4-0, and and they're doing it in dominating fashion. Combined margin of victory in the two games last week, 58 points. Shot nearly 50% from three-point range, 55% from the field. What a week for the Colonials and wins over St. Francis, Brooklyn, and Wagner. Glenn, I know for certain you were watching the game against St. Francis, Brooklyn. What are you noticing this year from uh, Robert Morris? Well, I think it's just kind of just what they always have. They have a tough mindset defensively. You know, they're not going to give you anything easy. And then at the same time, you know, they can really shoot the ball. You know, uh, including Josh Williams from last year, uh, always was matched up with him. And, uh, you know, just a crafty guy coming off of screens, uh, great catch and shoot shooter. Um, and, you know, and he poses a lot of threats. And, um, you know, when you combine that with the toughness of Andy Tool's defense, you know, they're, they're just a tough team to play against, and especially when you're playing them on the road in Pittsburgh. When you look at Josh Williams and John Williams and the way they're shooting the three, first of all, you take Josh now. In four NEC games, he's shooting over 71% from three-point range. Like, he's on a tear that you don't normally see. Have you ever seen a player, like, get that hot for an extended stretch like that? You know, confidence and momentum are huge things. And then especially when you are getting stops defensively, it just flows into your, into your uh, offense. Um, you know, I've seen this. Just, you know, I've seen this firsthand, thankfully, and I've seen it from other players as well. And I've even seen it from him. You know, last year he's, he, he lit us up a couple times, and he lit other teams up. And especially he's a really good player at home. So when he's getting a, a type of rhythm at home, it's really hard to stop. His shot is so – I'm saying this in a good way. It's formulaic. It's robotic. It's yeah. easy. It's relaxed. And I yeah. think you shot that way sometimes mm -hmm. too when I would watch you on your form. Did, how, does that, how does your shooting form play, play into it? When you combine it with like confidence yeah. that's warranted because you're making all your shots. Yeah, it's just, I mean, it just becomes, it comes with reps, right? So when you're just in the gym, just constantly shooting over and over again, you're, um, you're gaining confidence from there. And then when you start hitting them in the game, your confidence even builds even more. So I think it just comes from reps. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he puts a lot of time in. He has a nice, just smooth shot, no hitches. Um, it's just kind of just, you know, it's one motion, boom, out of his hands. And, uh, and it's also hard to block because he kind of brings it a little bit over his head a little bit. So it's just kind of hard to block. And, uh, you know, and he's just, he's just shooting it well right now. So you have Josh and John Williams ranked 1-2 in the NEC in three-point shooting. That's crazy to me. Yeah, well, but let's just quickly, let's talk about their defense. So already into four games, ranked first in the NEC in field goal percentage defense, defensive points per possession, second in turnover rate. So you have a team, as you said, they're, they're, they're tough to attack at times. What could you expect defensively when you played from an Andy Tool coach team? What made their defense so difficult to score on? Well, I think the, um, the thing that makes it difficult is that, you know, they just really buy into what they're doing, especially starting from my freshman year where they played zone. They were just playing zone for the whole year. And then as the years went on, they switched up to man. So uh, it kind of just shows that they really buy into what he wants to do because playing zone defense can be boring at times. It's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit hard. And then man, the same thing. It can be tough on, on, on defensive rotations and stuff. So, uh, you know, I think they really buy into what he wants. And, uh, you know, and they have great help. You know, when you're driving, they're right there digging in. So you have to just, you have to kind of pull back out. They close down driving lanes well. Uh, you know, they're a, tough, they're a tough team to score against. And then especially when the offense is rolling, it kind of just, you know, you're trying to get it back quicker, you know. So they're hitting threes. You're trying to get those threes back, and they kind of force you into bad shots. So, you know, that's really why I think Rob Morris is, uh, they're always hard to play against. And then even this year, the way they're shooting the ball, they're even tougher. Robert Morris off to a 4-0 start. Two more home games for them this week against Merrimack and Sacred Heart. We'll see if they can extend it out to 6-0.
All right, Glenn, now we move back to your old Brooklyn rivals, LIU, just down the road. After a tough first game, a loss down at the mound in double overtime, Sharks come back home, get a pair of wins, solid win over a, over a good FDU team on Saturday. We have Raekwon Clark, we have Jay Sean Agosto. I want to talk about both of those. For Raekwon Clark, you went up against this guy. He's been at the school, it seems like, seven or eight years now. How, how tough is it to deal with someone as so relentless and mindful of getting to the hoop as he is? Yeah. All right, before anything, though, it's so weird calling them the Sharks. I mean, I, like, it's, just, that's just, it's just weird for me to call them the Sharks. They're always the Blackbirds for me. But, um, you know, he's just a tough player to play against. And the fact that he has this extra year with another year um, under his belt of experience, you know, he's just so relentless going to the rim, like you said. Uh, and then he gets to the foul line as well, uh, you know, and then he's just kind of just crafty around the basket with little floaters, push shots, and just getting his body and using angles to get layups. So he's just a tough player to play against. And then, you know, when having that veteran leadership and experience, uh, you know, it's kind of, it's not really a surprise on why he's doing so well. It's just, you know, he's a, he's a very good player. I want to get into Jay Sean Augusto. Derek Kellogg said his game on Saturday when he had 20 points, he had 9 out of 11 shots from the field, was his best game since he's been the coach at LIU. Now, I know you've went up against yeah. Jay Sean many, many times. What's it like when you're dealing with a player with that sort of just end-to-end -end speed and quickness? Yeah. You know, Jay Sean's a really good player, and he's always someone that, you know, when I saw the Blackbirds on the schedule, I knew I had to rise my game to because he poses threats on, on both sides of the floor. He's, he's annoying on defense uh, in a good way, in a good way. And, uh, you know, and then he has that quick first step to the right, uh, you know, and when he, can, when he starts making shots, you know, he can drain them. So he's just a, a player that you kind of have to prepare for, and the kid just doesn't get tired. Like, he plays all game. He's been playing, like, 38 minutes since he's a, been a freshman. So it's just crazy how he's able to play that. And you kind of, as a competitor, you want to match that level of intensity and stamina and endurance. So, uh, he, you know, he brings a lot out of you. And, you know, and he had a great game. Nine for 11 from the field is just, that's tremendous. LIU been shooting threes uh, all season, one of the nation's leaders in made threes. Last week, they scored over 1.2 points per possession, made 64% of their two-point shots, 42 from three. Really good week for LIU. Before we drop uh, the Sharks, just wanted to say, <laughs> when you're just around the neighborhood, maybe in the summer, is the rivalry extend, or are you guys all buddies uh, off the court? Uh, the weird thing is, is this almost like, it's like there's like a line of demarcation in between us. Because I, we're just on this one side of, of Brooklyn, even though we're so close, and they're kind of by Junior's Cheesecake and whatnot, and uh, over there by Fulton Street. But we rarely see them on our side, and, and we don't really go over there. So we kind of just keep our distance a little bit, not in a way that we don't, um, you know, uh, like each other or anything, but there was there is one instance that we did have like a a mixed pickup game after the season. It was a really good run. It was just a, it was like a bunch of us and um, a bunch of them just you know just playing pickup and and uh, jo uh, Joel Hernandez was there too and he was he he was playing. It was just really competitive and it it was almost just like we were just having a regular game. You know, so it was just it was cool for that uh, for that to happen. And but but most of the time we kind of just keep our distance in a way that I don't think is intentional, but it just it just happens. The battle line's always drawn in Brooklyn. We'll talk more about the Battle of Brooklyn later on in the show. Next up, we go north to North Andover and our new friends from Merrimack, their inaugural season in the NEC. And wouldn't you know it, they are off to a 3-1 start after a sweep last week. Warriors coming off wins over Mount St. Mary's, Central Connecticut. Frenetic defense installed by Joey Gallo. Merrimack, 11th in Division I with a 25% turnover rate. We'll talk a little more about Javaris Hayes and his ability to steal the ball. Merrimack creating turnovers left and right. They play his own defense, but it's not your father's zone defense. They are out in your face there. Do you think that they pose a problem because it's something so different that you don't normally see, sort of that Syracuse type zone that's not that common around the country? Yeah, you know, sometimes those defenses are just 
even tougher to play against than any defense because it's, it's almost like they're fooling you to do stuff that you don't really want to do. And this kind of reminded me of Mount, how Mount used to play uh, when uh, Coach Jamie on Christian was there. Uh, you know, they had that like that matchup zone with Junior Robinson at the top, and it was just like, what are you in? Are you in a man or zone? It doesn't, you don't really know. And, um, you know, and then the fact that you're active with it, it's just they're covering all areas of the floor in the half court, and then you, they're just going to force you into turnovers. And then the fact that they're not turning it over on the other end is just, you know, this is a recipe to win. Merrimack has three of its best players played in the same high school together. Hmm. They've been playing together forever. Yeah. Chemistry, how much of a role does that play on a team like this? Moving into the NEC, everything is new, but they're not new to each other. What do you think that does for them as a team? Yeah, I think chemistry is probably the biggest and most important thing that you need on a team. You got to be able to trust one another uh, on and off the court. Uh, and you got to be able to just, you know, rely on one another to make plays. And, you know, when you're playing with somebody from high school, as, and then as this is going on to going on eight years, I mean, come on, like, you know, NBA franchises play with each other for eight years. And if you can keep an NBA franchise together for, for eight years, the chemistry is going to be great. And that translates on any level, whether it's uh, Division One, Division Two, And then it's also that incentive, okay, we're coming from a Division Two school, we got to prove ourselves in this new conference. And then when you have people that you can rely on and then a coach who has a good structure for you, um, you know, the sky's the limit. And it's, it's looking like that. And they've been playing well, not even just in conference play, but even from the non-conference play with big uh, non-conference wins. Uh, you know, so they're, you know, they're a tough team and someone that, that shouldn't, shouldn't be slept on at all because of their previous uh, level of play. Merrimack announced themselves by beating Northwestern, as Glenn referenced. Offensively, balanced scoring. Idris Joyner, a big week last week, averaged 13.5 points, 7.5 rebounds, shot 75%. We'll get into Javaris Hayes' exploits a little bit later in the show, but a great start to NEC play for the NEC's newest program. We wrap up our weekend takeaways with St. Francis University. The Flash gets some home cooking last week, win over Wagner, and then a thriller against St. Francis, Brooklyn. St. Francis now 23-11 at home in league games over the last three-plus seasons, and at 10-5, this is the best start for the Red Flash since 1997-98, when ironically, head coach Rob Krimmel and assistant coach Eric Taylor were both players in the program. Glenn, I know that you've, you know, you've had your wars with the Red Flash over the years. You were telling me before, they're sort of a well-oiled machine on <clears throat> offense, yeah. and they've improved from when you started, how much they've improved till now. What's it like playing against them? Yeah, I think one thing that can get um, overlooked is not just how they Im improve this as a team, but individually. I mean, they have great player development over there. Uh, you see it from just everybody who has just improved over the years. I mean, uh, Keith has always been good over from from when the start. But in particular, like Jamal King, who was coming off the bench his first year, and then just becomes a two-time first league all, all, all league player. So they're really good at just um, at producing and, and improving their players. And then their their offense has just you know grown, and they've gotten better defensively. You know, before in the past they were a little, they had some lapses defensively. But, um, you know, they've just really locked in and gotten better defensively. And then their offense is just so sharp. Everybody can really is really a threat out there scoring the ball. And then they have talent on top of that to just really take those plays over the top. So they're just a tough team to play against. And, uh, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the trip over there I don't, for, for all these NEC teams, but they, it's hard to play over there. And, uh, you know, they usually have a good turnout with the crowd. Uh, and, you know, they're just a tough team to play against, especially at home. Let's take, we always talk about Keith Braxton on the show. I want to show some love to Isaiah Blackman, mm -hmm. yeah. another one that you, you went toe to toe with. He's healthy and he's one of those players that not only is he, you know, one of the premier, one of the top shooters in the league from mm -hmm. distance, but he's another guy that can take it to the rim and elevate over you. What have you seen in his game and the progression of his game over time? Well, one thing that I just really respect about him is that how he's had all these injuries, uh, including like myself, I had that injury and he just, you know, a lot of people can just kind of just tank a little bit mentally and just, you know, accept that this is what it is and I'm not going to really work on my game. But uh, I remember hearing something, I don't know where I heard it, but that he said he was going to come back and be even better than he was before. Um, and he's kind of shown that. And he's also another example of how player development works in that program. You know, when he first started off, he was just a strictly, I'm going to go to the basket, athletic, which he still is. But now that he's added that shot and he's one of the better shooters in the league and he has been even for the past three years, um, you know, well, two years because one of the years he was hurt. 
Uh, so, you know, he's just become a, a really great offensive threat for them. And then when you combine him with Keith and then Jamal last year, they're just a tough team to prepare for. St. Francis on the move, and we haven't forgotten about the buzzer beater. We'll get to that later on NEC on the Run. Time for our Twitter timeout. Mount fan blog after Mount's win on the road at Bryant. What a quality win that was. Mount fan blog, good win on the road. As long as my heart starts again in the next few minutes, all turned out well. This one went right down to the wire. You had Adam Grant providing heroics for the home team as always. And then you had the Mount front court getting it done as they have been all season. Let me start with Adam Grant, another guard that you had to you had to deal with him. Did you ever have, did you guard him? Yeah, I always had to guard him. Yeah, yeah. Which is a, it was an, it was annoying, but I had to guard him. But uh, you know, I'm always up for the challenge of guarding the other team's uh, best player. And then I always have great mutual respect for uh, you know the, these players that we play against in this league. And he's just someone who is not only talented scoring, but he's relentless. You know, he just keeps wanting to go after you, so you're always on your toes. Um, and, and he can just score in so many different ways. He has floaty, he has a quick first step, he rises up into his shot quick. He has great lift on his shot, so it's like really hard to contest him. Um, and you know, he's just been a great scorer in, in, our, in our league for, for so many years already. Adam Grant, one of the NEC's all-time best three-point shooters, rising up the charts still, just missed on this final shot to win it for Bryant. Now let's talk a little about Mount St. Mary's. One of the youngest teams in the nation last season, still dominated by underclassmen in 2019-20, but it's the front court. Malik Jefferson, Nana Apoku, they are getting it done. Two bigs that can go inside, can go outside. Last week combined for 30 points, 16 rebounds, shot 60% in the win at Bryant. How important is it, is it in the NEC, Glenn? to have bigs that can really go? How much do they change the game? Yeah, you know, they're honestly the X factors because every team usually, for the past, since I've been there, has had guards that are just not only good, they can, they're can they great guards that can play at any level. You've seen it in the transfers, you've seen it in the statistics that they've posted. Um, you know, so these guards are legit. So when the bigs are on a different level, even if it's just defensively doing the little things, uh, you know, they really add a new dy dynamic to your team and just make you that much better of a ball club, um, you know. And I think, you know, Mount has the, these bigs, you know, we, I've experienced them last year who you can just see the potential there that they're going to just keep getting better. And even from this year, they're going to continue to improve, uh, you know. So there's a lot of special uh, things going down in Emmitsburg down there. That was a big road win for the Mount against the solid Bryant team. We'll see if the Mount can keep it rolling this week. We move on to our under the radar player now. And to do so, we go out to Moon Township and we highlight Dante Tracy, sophomore guard for the Colonials. What a year he's having. One of the NEC's most improved players has lifted his scoring more than six points a game this year, 4.4 assists per game. Glenn, he does remind me a little bit of your game, especially at that point in your respective careers. Is there anything from uh, Dante's game that reminds you of yourself? Um, yeah, and I would say how he's taking care of the ball in this, uh, these first few games of the conference play. You know, one thing that I, I always try to pride myself on and what I look at in other players is how many good plays they can make without giving those plays back to the other team. And he's averaging uh, about five assists and I think like 1.9 turnovers. So that's a really good ratio if you want, especially at, um, if you're a, a ball handler on a, on a team. And then just the fact that he's improving, you know, self-improvement um, and then that ultimately leads to team improvement. And he's just doing a good job of just, you know, continuing to get better. And, uh, you know, that's where I kind of see the similarities of where he's uh, that turnover thing, just having control over the ball and not giving that many opportunities to the other team. Whereas opposed to last year, he was kind of turning the ball over. That was even on the scouting reports, kind of get into him because, you know, and that happens when you're a freshman. But the fact that he's improving now as a sophomore and showing that, uh, you know, he's taking that responsibility of, uh, you know, of taking care of the ball and being another ball handler along John Williams, it's, it's, it's pretty nice to see. How much does it help an offense when you have two skilled ball handlers playing together? So they have Dante Tracy and John Williams. You, when you started, you were with Brent Jones, one of the NEC, great NEC point guards of, yeah. of recent vintage. How much does it help when you have the ability to have two floor generals out there at the same time? Yeah, it's great. And it's just not only great for the balance of the team, but it's just great for the turnover percentage. You know, when you have two people, point guards essentially, that can take care of the ball, 
Uh, you're not giving that many opportunities to the other team. And you've seen it kind of being a little bit um, put into most offensives nowadays. Uh, and I think it kind of really started with um, with Villanova when they won the national title with Brunson and Archie Diacono just having those two guards. And then I think a lot of coaches are trying to take that away. And then it worked for me and Brent uh, that just, you know, we had we didn't really have the same style of game. I think that it was... Uh, I was a more, uh, he was more attacking, like he was just, he was trying to get a bucket a lot. And, uh, you know, I had that a little bit in me too, but especially me learning from him and just the way that he was able to see things on, uh, on the offensive side of the court. And then especially when you have a senior or an, even an underclassman doing it together, um, it's great because now there's two different things. There's youth there and then there's also, uh, there's also senior and veteran leadership. So uh, when you have both of those combinations with both uh, players that can handle the ball, uh, it just makes your team that much better, and especially in the turnover department, which Rob Morris is doing great in right now. Dante Tracy, he's under the radar now, but maybe not for that much longer with the way he's playing this season for the Colonials. Glenn, we move on to our star watch. This week, we spotlight Sacred Hearts, Kareem Ozier, a sophomore guard, a high-scoring sophomore guard. He is built on his all-rookie NEC campaign. Now he's doing it efficiently in three league games, averaging over 18 points on 47% shooting. Had a team high 23 points in Sacred Heart's win, two point win at FDU last Thursday. Glenn, last year you played against Kareem twice. He struggled in those meetings, but what did you see in his game that would lead you to believe he could blossom into one of the league's top perimeter scorers that he's turned into this year. Yeah, I think all of us as being at this on this level of basketball, we know that um, you know, just because you might not have a good game against uh, on, on even if it's on two games of the season, that doesn't mean that you're not a good player or don't have the skill set that you're really good. So we knew how good he was and I think the reason yeah, he I think us knowing that he was that good was the reason why we played so hard against him um, and just try to limit his shots uh, you know, and and luckily he didn't have great games against us, but we saw what he was doing to other teams in the league. And uh, we see how, and that he was only a freshman, so he's only going to continue to get better, and you're seeing it this year. Uh, you know, he's he's just a crafty scorer. He's able to shoot the basketball. He can get to his pull-up jump shot nice, and then he has a handle with it. So he's just a tough player to guard. And, um, you know, the, the older he gets, the more experience he gets, he's going to get only better. So, you know, it's impressive that he has these numbers as only a sophomore, too. Um, so... You know, I'm just, there's a bright future ahead for him and also Sacred Heart. Kareem Ozier, no shortage of confidence in, in yeah, that yeah, kid yeah, either, yeah. man. He wants to shoot all yeah, the time. He loves to shoot. <laughs> Sacred Heart scores a lot of points. They're 2-1 and one in the league. Kareem Ozier is one of the reasons why they are picked second in the conference this season. Time for our NEC Play of the Week. This was an easy one, Glenn. Randall Gaskins delivers the Stone oh, Cold man. Stunner at the buzzer to get your Terriers out in Loretto on Saturday. He goes coast to coast. All right, so the first question, I know this one hurts to talk about, but we <laughs> got to get through this. Your thought that that ball went to him rather than to Blackman or to Braxton going length of the court, how much confidence does that show that Rob Krimmel has in his senior guard? Yeah, it shows a lot of confidence. And, um, you know, he's a type of player that can get to the basket. He's always been able to. So I'm not really surpri not that surprised that they drew it up for him. And, um, and I'm sure that Coach Rob Krimmel knew that, say, Francis Brooklyn was going to have a focus on Blackman and, and Braxton, knowing that those are the two main, uh, main guys. And just I thought that just to play, although I don't, I'm not real happy about it, but I'm sure I'm, the play call was very good. It was very good because it just it's a hard thing to guard as a um, as a team when you're only up by one. You don't want to foul, but at the same time you want to play some type of defense. So you're just kind of caught in between, and you're almost just not playing as hard defense as you want to because you don't want to foul. So when they're coming at you as fast as he was, it was just like. Um, you know, and then the other, the, the help defense are also staying with their man because they don't want to be the person to get the game winner scored on their man. Uh, so it, it's just a tough thing to guard. And it was just, and also, it wasn't even the most, the easiest shot either. He's running full speed, going to his right, and then um, Unique uh, McLean gave a good contest at the end, who's an athletic guy with his outstretched hand, and he was able to make the shot. And oh man, but uh, <laughs> it was a, it was a great play. You got you have to give credit where it's due, and um, you know. I don't think that'll be the last time you see that play from St. Francis or any other teams. I'm, I'm sure other teams will pick that up as well. The only positive from this, Glenn, is that you didn't have to take the trip home after that happened. Yeah, oh, man. 
Oh, man. Rough. The trip is the trip is rough as, as it is. But just that that three and a half hour ride and through the mountains is tough. But then especially after a loss, you know, it's so much sweeter after a win. So, props to Randall Gaskins Jr. He went coast to coast to win it for the Flash on Saturday. That was our play of the week. Time for NEC milestones. We will start with Merrimack's Juvaris Hayes. What an accomplishment this is. Just the fourth player in NCAA history to accumulate 400 career steals. And he's not done yet. He has a chance to become the all-time NCAA steals leader. Very realistic. He has 400 now. 448 is the record. Glenn, we talked about Merrimack's defense and how that has sparked the team to a 3-1 and one start. When you look at Juvaris Hayes, how does he do it? It's not that easy. You know, yeah. getting 400 steals, nobody's done it. What is he doing right? I think the first thing he's doing right is that, you know, any great defensive player, they have to want to play defense. And there's a difference between, you know, every, you probably think everybody wants to play defense. No, but there's a little difference about, you know, not having the feeling of getting embarrassed, not having the feeling of getting crossed over or scored on. Just, I'm going to guard this guy. I'm going to lock him down. And I think he has that mindset, you know what I mean? And then, uh, like you said, you know, playing at the top of the zone and just being being active and getting in passing lanes, uh, you know, that kind of, it puts second, it puts a second thought in offensive players' heads that they don't want to throw the ball there. They don't want to throw the ball there. And he's kind of just mastered it a little bit where he just knows where the ball is going to be. And then, you know, you know, similar to what you said, that he's turning it into offense as well. Uh, you know, he's probably just a headache for, for coaches to, to prepare for and for players to deal with as well. Javaris Hayes, first in the nation in steals, first in steal rate. His steal rate of 6.4%, that's the highest in the Ken Palm era in the NEC, and it's not even close. You could see the graphic. Javaris Hayes making life miserable for the Warriors' opponents. He's one of our milestone performers. Let's move on to our next one. We talk about him seemingly every week. Keith Braxton has now moved into third place on the NEC's career rebound chart. 1,023 rebounds. He's on target possibly to break your buddy's record, Jalen Cannon, who holds the record. We talked about this before, but let me get your take on it. He's a guard, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's a, he that's plays, a, he plays point guard, and he's 6'4". How is this guy going to become our all-time rebound leader? You yeah. said you want to have to want to play defense. Do you have to want to rebound? Yeah. You have to want to rebound. Rebounding is it's part of it is just um, you know honestly most of it is just positioning and it, it's it's weird because although Keith is six four, Jalen was six five, so that's already two people in the top three point, all time yeah. that are just are are not you know your typical bigs. And I think it's just about having a knack for the ball and then having good footwork and just being where uh, seeing where other people aren't what are other people aren't seeing and getting to spots that they uh, they wouldn't foresee. So, you know, Keith is is a great player at doing that and just has a great knack for the ball. And then, you know, what makes him even better is that he's just doing so much more on the offensive end as well. He's just he could just really do it. Just do it all. And he's and he's a good kid, too. You know, I had some time to uh, uh, talk to him. Uh, when we were doing the photo shoot last year and whatnot, and he has, he has his head on his shoulders. He's a good, humble kid, and he's he's another player who has always improved over the years. And um, see, and he seems like a great teammate too. You know, he doesn't seem like he's that type of kid to uh, to want to just worry about you know the personal accolades, although they come along with it because he just happens to be a good player. Um, so you know, you just see you see that in him, and then it kind of I think it just kind of spreads out to the whole team, and he's a, just a terrific leader for them. That's high praise for Keith Braxton, the person from Glenn. We'll see what happens as Keith Braxton tries to become the NEC's career rebounding king. Now we look ahead, our TV games and games to watch this week. We start nationally televised game out of the Rothman Center on Wednesday. It's a rematch of last year's title game. St. Francis U visits FDU. Two teams in different places right now. What do you see going down in this one? You know, every game in the NEC is competitive, and I think this will be no different. I think there's going to be a little bit of, um, you know, some fire coming out of SFU because they lost to them last year. And I think it's also an important game for uh, FDU because this is similar to how they were last year, not starting off great. And then, you know, sat, actually the, the game that really turned it around for them was when the, we lost to them at their place. They just went on a streak where they just kept winning and winning, and it rolled right into, conference, it rolled right into the conference playoffs. So this would be a good, important game after four games already. Um, done in the, in, the, in the beginning of the conference schedule for them to try to get their, uh, their feedback onto them. And then they're going to be playing a, um, a rival. And 
I think it's also important for them to show that, you know, we beat you last year for a reason and we want to prove that again uh, this year. I, I think you're right. FDU is super talented, and I think they're going to be just fine. Mm -hmm. That game is at 5 o'clock on ESPNU, but when it's done, don't go anywhere. Switch the dial over to SNY for our New York Metro folks. It also will be on NEC Front Row. This is the one we got to get into. It's LIU and St. Francis, Brooklyn. Now, technically, this isn't the Battle of Brooklyn. No, but it's, it's always the Battle of Brooklyn. It's always, the, it's battle always the Battle of Brooklyn. Of Brooklyn. What, when this game is on the schedule... You circling this on the calendar? Like, yeah. how much thought goes into this one? 100%. It's, it's just, it's kind of reminds me of my high school. We had this, uh, this high school, Curtis High School, who were right down the block from us. And we used to play them on Thanksgiving year. Every year for 90 years straight, we played them. And it was always just about bragging rights. You know, it's not a do-all game or end-all game, uh, but it's just about bragging rights. You know what I mean? And, you can, and it carries some momentum. All right, we beat our rival. Let's go into our next game and win. I think it's going to be the same thing. I think it's important for both teams to come out and play well. Um, LIU has won their last two. St. Francis Brooklyn has lost their last two. So it's going to be important um, you know, for, for both teams to go out and play. And the intensity is going to be high. It, it, it always is. Every team rises to the occasion when they play each other in these games. And uh, you know, it should be a fun one to watch. Looking ahead, our next TV game will be on CBS Sports Network, January 20th, Martin Luther King Day at 5 p.m. This is a good one. Robert Morris, 4-0, playing host to 2-1 at this time, Sacred Heart. This is a battle of two NEC contenders right here. I think this could be one of the games of the year. I just think the way these teams match up with each other. Yeah. What's your thoughts on this one? Um, well, I think, first of all, it's going to be a... a, a a shootout because you know you have a high power offense in Sacred Heart who is just they've always been good at all in offense um and you know and now you have Robert Morris who's playing well and shooting the ball unbelievably so I think it's about who's getting stops you know what I mean I think both teams are going to be able to score um and then what's who's going to be an answer for uh, EJ and Ezekiel you know what I mean who's how, how are they going to be able to game plan for against him um I think the um the John Williams, Josh Williams, excuse me, Josh Williams and Ozier matchup will be will be nice to watch. And then it's going to be a scra it's going to be scrappy guard play, and it's going to be uh, you know who can get enough stops at the end to win the game. So you know it'll be a fun game to watch. So to recap: we have two nationally televised games, a regionally televised affair. All the other games can be watched on NEC Front Row or on the NEC On the Run series of streaming and mobile apps. Looking forward to this week's action. That's a wrap on this week's NEC on the Run. I want to give a big thanks to Glenn Sanabria. By the way, great job today. <laughs> thank you you thank can come in whenever you want <laughs> to sit here. We'll kick Ryan Peters right out the door. <laughs> we'll bring you in again. This was a lot of fun. Thanks, thanks for coming. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I had a fun time today. And, uh, you know, I love talking hoops. So if I can come here and talk hoops anytime, I'm, I'm more than willing to do that for sure. So we talked hoops with Glenn Sanabria. We'll be back next week for another edition of NEC on the Run. <laughs>